It is a pleasure to welcome Spencer Charnas from Ice Nine Kills to the first ever episode of Mosh Talks. Spencer, um, lockdown has been a bit of a bummer for most of us, but you made it a hell of a lot brighter with your version of uh, Fountains of Wayne, Stacey's mum in the style of Jason's mum to go alongside the whole horror theme of the, sil uh, of the Silver Scream so far. Um, when did that come about and how did that idea come together? Because I have to say, you look so stoked when you were recording it. It's unreal. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. It was a lot of fun. To be honest about, I want to say a month ago, uh, the idea just came to me. I was uh, I had been listening to Founds of Wayne because I'm, I'm a fan of that band and I, I've listened to them for years. Uh, not just that song, but like songs like Sink to the Bottom. Just They've always written great pop songs. And it, it, just, it came to my mind, wow, I can't believe no one's ever thought to do a Friday the 13th theme with that song because it, it would work perfectly as far as uh, the relation to a mother character. And I thought about that, and then I realized, oh my God, Mother's Day is next month. This would be a perfect time to record that cover, and it, it kind of just went from there. I wrote the lyrics to it, I think, within a day or so, and I went over to my bandmate's house, Joe's house, and we recorded it and then sent the other parts back to the other members, and it worked out fantastic. And I was glad that we could also include a little nod to Norman Bates and Psycho at the end of it. I mean, that speaks volumes about where you've been on this whole album campaign. In fact, it's killed me that I haven't had the chance to talk to you about it since literally the day the album came out. We did that interview in the Black Craft st uh, store. Something that has really jumped out about the last year and a half, or certainly since that day, is as someone that about 10 years ago bought an Ice Nine Kill shirt with a zombie Will Ferrell on it, like like so long ago that even before the memes had kind of taken Anchorman for their own. Um, what stands out is that this has been by far and away the most successful campaign to date. And I wondered if that was because it was the most natural extension of yourself. Like everything about the Silver Screen campaign has just roared fun and authenticity it feels like a real extension of yourself this record and this campaign i agree i think that great art i think comes from a place that that's that's real and not manufactured you know this, this stuff has been in my dna since i was a little kid i've always uh, just been gravitating towards the horror genre and uh, I've always loved metal, and I've always loved punk, and I've always loved pop. So this was like an amalgamation of, of all those influences into one melting pot. And I think you, you, you hit the, the nail on the head in the sense that it, it screams fun, because that's how, that's how we made it. It was just a really fun, interesting, rewarding process. It was... Um, just less stressful than any album I think I've ever been involved with because I knew the material so well and I think the only really somewhat stressful part was living up to the movies because these are classics that you know I hold very near and dear to my twisted heart so I just wanted to do them justice but I, I think that that really uh, speaks volumes about the success of the album and you're absolutely right. It, it, uh, it rings true to everything I love, and I think you can you can really you can really see that in everything from the music to the videos to the merchandise. That yeah. this was just a really great fun process. One one of the other things that really stands out is that you have a background in Broadway and it, like a sort of theatre theatre, I should say. Like um, and uh, that shows through in your songwriting on this record i was particularly this morning i was listening to the director's cut version and your numbers up and the beginning of it literally it feels like something out of a stage show is that theatricality and that sort of danny elfman style vibe to you as a songwriter it feels like this is a peanut butter and jelly situation of things coming together 
Absolutely, and thank you for saying that. I've uh, always admired musicals, especially Lame as a Rob, Fan of the Opera, even stuff like Grease. And uh, it's weird. It's like, I don't, when I sit down, I don't set out to say, I want to make this like a Broadway show. It just, it just seems like the perfect fit for telling these kind of stories. And uh, I'm so glad that people uh, appreciate that and enjoy it. And it's also very rewarding because I think that maybe a lot of people who wouldn't listen to musical kind of sounding material are getting to hear that stuff. And, and whether they're going out and, and then going to listen and you know see a performance of Les Miserables, I don't know. I haven't heard too much about that. But if I can uh, sway people at all or influence them to check out musical theater and sort of broaden their horizons for what music can be, uh, you know, I've done my job. Uh, the 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 videos and the way the music videos all play into one another and kind of all lead to that big reveal uh, on the on the the it song um, that must have been a blast to put together conceptually. How did that come together? Because it's one thing having these cool videos and these cool homages to those movie, but it's another thing to insert Ice Nine Kills and to insert yourself into a running narrative. How did that get that concept come together? That came to me very early on in the making of the album. I thought, how cool would it be to be able to interconnect our videos? And, and we actually did something similar on the last album, Every Trick in the Book, where... Uh, it was a, an interlock story uh, with recurring themes and, and some recurring characters and sort of uh, a book being passed around through generations. And I thought, let's take it a step further and let's put the band into the story and let, let's put it in sort of a, a meta reality. And I've always been a fan of films like, as you mentioned, Scream. Uh, and I thought that that would be just a really interesting take and a lot of fun. And uh, as much as I love horror, I love comedy as well. And I also, I also wanted that uh, side to, to show through in, in the film. And then I took it to our very talented director friend, Daniel Horhan, and we put the story together. Mate, you mentioned the comedy side of things. You and Brandon from Atreus... April Fool's Day got me hook, line, and sinker because you were posting that you were going to release like an EP of songs based on Adam Sandler movies. I wanted that so badly. It just felt like something that would even work. <laughs> I think it actually could. You know, uh, Brandon and I have a very similar senses of humor, sort of that deadpan comedy delivery, and we had a lot of fun with that with that particular joke. Uh, we met. I've always been a big fan of Atreyu, so to meet him when we toured with them about, I want to say, a year and a half ago, we definitely bonded pretty quickly over our love of Adam Sandler, and uh, we thought it'd be a funny, funny joke, and I actually had already had a shirt made up that we were going to sell at some point with Ice Nine Kills that said Happy Killmore, so I thought, ah, this is perfect. <laughs> Like, Sandler's rage fits, the all right style of things would work so well as a mosh call as well. I think so, when, he, when he's beating that clown at the uh, the putting range with the club, yeah. with the golf club, be perfect. You, you're going to die, clown. Um, it's, in, it's interesting to see, going back to horror, something that's really interesting to see is since the release of uh, The Silent Scream, it feels like horror has gone in a slightly different direction. While your record pays homage to the classics, there's been a real uprising in psychological horror when you look at Midsummer and Hereditary and even stuff like Mandy, I guess to a certain extent, Get Out. Do you think that the changing face of horror will have any impact on Ice Nine Kills moving forward? I think perhaps, but I tend to, whenever we were looking for films for inspiration, to go a little bit backward, uh, more towards retro stuff. Um, but hey, you know, what's coming out right now could affect us in 10 years, who knows? But I think it, it's great to see the genre continuing to move forward and try new things. And uh, it's always cool to, to see things come in cycles. You know, right now, as you said, that that psychological sort of get out 
Um, Jordan Peele kind of film seems to be really hot right now. And uh, who knows, you know, maybe the next wave will be slashers again. So it's always interesting to, um, to, to admire what's going on with the genre. And, and so great to see so many studios like Blumhouse sort of carrying the torch and, and, and pushing it forward. Do you think that it helped, with, with, like, with you doing this album campaign? It's only just come to mind with you saying it now. With Halloween getting rebooted and with that film being so sick, like, I have to say, that one where it follows Michael with the one shot where he's going through the house, like, no spoilers, but, like, I'll leave it at that, was so sick. Do you think things like that and the rise of Blumhouse has helped Ice Nine on the Silver Scream album campaign? I think so. You know, I think horror has always, even when it's not super in the mainstream, you know, there's been waves of it with the, with the 80s slasher boom that, that really took the world by storm with, with those films coming out like almost every weekend after Halloween and Friday the 13th and Black Christmas. Uh, there was that whole wave and then it sort of died out and uh, then again came back up with, with the release of Scream, which kind of reinvented the genre and changed everything and made horror hot again. So I think that it's always been there under the service kind of waiting to bubble up again. And I think that uh, the timing of the album happened to to uh, coincide very well with another resurgence in, in mainstream horror. And, uh, you know, I'd be lying if I said when back in the summer of, uh, I want to say 2017, when I started to write the album, it was definitely back in, my, in the back of my mind, wow, Hopefully this album comes out just as the new Halloween is coming out because there was, you know, already that was a very open uh, topic that that was going to be filmed and uh, it, it worked out perfectly. And with it as well, I think it was, it was a combination of right time, right place. Like, with you putting together the... Oh, I should ask, did you like Halloween? Did you like the Halloween reboot movie? I think Danny McBride is so talented. I love Eastbound and Down, but I've really loved Vice Principals and The Righteous Gemstones <laughs> and him being involved in it. Did you, did you like the last Halloween reboot? I really did, and uh, it's funny because I'm also a big Danny McBride uh, fan, and when I would watch Eastbound and Down uh, years ago, way before there were even talks of this Halloween reboot, and way before, obviously, Danny McBride was involved, there were certain little Easter eggs throughout that franchise of Eastbound and Down, of the series, rather, that led me to believe this guy, he's a slasher fan because he referenced Michael Myers in one episode, he referenced Ghostface from Scream, and I thought, yeah, he's got to be a slasher fan, so to see... When I heard that he was involved, it was surprising, but at the same time, it's like, you know, I kind of, I kind of, it's not that surprising when you go back and look at those little Easter eggs he put through that series. But yeah, I really did enjoy that film. I thought it was a really cool take. It was an interesting um, idea, I thought, to get rid of the idea that Lori is Michael's brother, um, and sorry, Lori is Michael's sister, because... Over the years, and, 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 and I somewhat agree with this um, opinion and stance that the more you learn about Michael as far as, oh, that's his sister, and he's trying to stop the bloodline, and you know, that was alluded to in, in Halloween 6, Curse of Michael Myers, the more you learn about that, a little bit, the less scary it makes him because it's a guy with a motive. So the idea, and I think the reason, part of the reason the first one was so scary is that you don't know what made him go, that's who I'm going to kill. So I think it was a nice uh, return to form in that sense, and I thought there were some great sequences, and uh, yeah, I really did enjoy it. Yeah, I, I, th I thought that the, the, they didn't scrimp on the gore as well. Like, it was really cool. And while you're doing this album cycle, have you got the bug in any way to kind of create your own script or kind of create your own kind of Ice Nine Kills icon, like a, a Leatherface or a, or a Jason Voorhees, something like that. When you look to the future, is that something that you could see emerging? Absolutely. I think that uh, this band and, and what we've been doing would be a really cool launching pad for something like that. So that's definitely, definitely in my mind for the future. How, how, how far are we into 
bringing the future together because you know you've been touring this record a while now so presumably yeah. ideas are starting to flow absolutely and and you know i always try to look at the positive of any situation and uh, one of the, the positives i could find in this whole pandemic and you know being forced to, to be home is that they've definitely started to write a lot more and we're definitely a lot further along in the process of formulating ideas than we would have been had we been on the road Obviously, you know, that tour would have been incredible, um, but I'm confident the tour will will happen at, at some point, and uh, I think we, we've just, we've put the writing in place of that right now, and, and uh, sort of ahead of the game in that in that respect. Yeah, it felt like Arenas was going to be such a good time as well, with that theatricality of what you can bring to something like that space. I mean, fingers crossed that does go ahead. It's really cool to hear that, you've started writing and started everything coming together. Like, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I guess, I'm having a lot of fun with Oh, yeah? So, so right, how, how deep are you? Uh, I, I, you know, I've got, a man, like, ideas for, like, se- I want to say seven or eight songs already. I don't want to say exactly what they're about, but uh, very excited about what, what, what's, uh, what's being talked about and what's being created and uh, just the idea of trying to, always one up ourselves and, and, and keep, keep it exciting and uh, take into account what everyone loves about ink and, and trying to do something different at the same time while still maintaining what we love and what people love about the band. Cause I, I think we're lucky in the sense that what we love about the band is it seems to be what our fans love about the band. And so to, just to close up, um, with this being a lockdown situation and with us all kind of being cooped up at the moment, I just wondered if there's a horror movie you've seen in like the last six months or so that you could recommend to people during this uh, quarantine situation. I think one of the best horror thriller films I've seen in the last few years is The Invisible Man. I was blown away by that film. Um, and I was bummed that I didn't get to see it in the theater because obviously uh, the whole quarantine and pandemic ru- ruined theatrical releases. But it was such a, a suspenseful film. I found myself on the edge of my seat. Um, and I thought it was such a, a clever, interesting retelling of the old myth with a whole new spin on it where it seemed completely fresh but also paid homage to what was so special um, about the original and the themes of the original still hold 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 and ring as powerful as ever in this new uh, adaptation so i highly recommend that film I, I was blown away i like the fact that they managed social commentary without it feeling too on the nose like it, yes. it, it, it just nailed the right tone i was really impressed and you gotta be stoked that that looks like it's going to lead to more universal monsters movies that's what i hear i'm very excited about that and also you know i'm i'm, I'm a kind of guy that loves smart marketing i get a kick out of that kind of clever marketing and what the invisible man did uh, I was lucky enough to get some promotional um, material sent to me from the film. And what The Invisible Man and Blumhouse and Universal did is that they sold an action figure for The Invisible Man, but there's nothing in the package. It's just it's just the package and it's The Invisible Man. So that's pretty <laughs> genius. That is awesome. Spencer, we'll come back once you're further along or once the the arena tour like is on the road and whatnot it'd be brilliant to have you back again and uh i have real t-shirt envy at the shirt that you are currently rocking oh thank you very much yeah it's a good one (laughs) awesome spencer thanks for your time man i'll see you next time take care thanks a lot man